year and one year experience. So I want to remind both the speaker that the word of the day is Vinavala. <laughs> See if you can insert that somewhere. Our first speaker is Scott Holland. He has a wonderful introduction. One distressed newscaster long ago started commenting on the TV. Ladies and gentlemen, here I am. Back of stone wall that adjoins Mr. Wilmot's garden. From here, I get a sweep of the whole scene. I'll give you every detail as long as I can talk, as long as I can see. Most state police have arrived. They're drawing up cordon in front of the pit, about 30 of them. No need to push the crowd back now. They are willing to keep their distance. The captain is conferring with someone. We can't see who. Oh, yes. I believe it's Professor Pearson. Yes, it is. Now they are parted. The professor moves around one side, studying the object, while the captain and two policemen advance with something in their hands. I can see it now. It's a white handkerchief tied to a pole, a flag of truth. If those creatures now know what it means, what anything means, wait, wait, something is happening. This was an excerpt from 1938 Orson Welles radio drama, War of the Worlds. Alien life from other worlds is a concept that so captivated and scared the people that time that this fictional radio story sent a wave of panic through many American homes one Sunday evening on October 30, 1938. This is the background. Our first speaker today also has an affinity for gazing towards the stars and wondering if there is a life out there. He found his own science fiction outlet growing up. He was a giant geek for the television show x Files. But today, Scott Hallenbach is going to leave science fiction for science fact and talk about science, what science says about life beyond our little rock floating in the space. The main thrust of his talk today will be about Fermi paradox, named after physicist Enrico Fermi, who explored the apparent contradiction between a large and vast galaxy but the severe lack of other alien civilization. From the competent, competent communicator, project number three, get to the point. Time is five minutes to seven minutes, time is Miss Timer. Scott Hollenbach. Thank you, Master Speaker. I intentionally wrote that introduction so I could hear Robert Carr speak Orson Welles radio hour. I think his voice was perfect for it. <laughs> uh, my speech is get to the point, so I will do just that. <laughs> the year was 1950. Uh, the location was Los Alamos, New Mexico, at the Los, uh, Los Alamos Science Center in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Uh, this was by a Department of Energy project. Does anybody know what the Department of Energy does? I know. It's mostly just known for a trove pursuit question for Perry, but the Department of Energy actually uh, made the main thing that they work on is nuclear weapons. And so these were uh, rocket scientists. Uh, they were had spent the morning uh, discussing a New Yorker cartoon about uh, an author's idea of what happens to a lot of the garbage cans, the public garbage cans, in, in their local area. And here you can see it's it's a group of aliens uh, getting off the street of ship and grabbing these, these garbage cans and taking them home with them. Uh, they spent the morning kind of discussing this, and then they kind of spent the rest of the morning discussing how there have been a spate of UFO sightings across, across the United States. And this conversation went for most of the day until the afternoon. And at one point at lunch, uh, Enrico Fermi, uh, the, the, the physicist, jumps up in the middle of lunch and says, where is everybody? And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, the Fermi paradox, or based off of Enrico Fermi, um, is the idea that, or the question of 
why the units reverse is so vast, but we do not see that much alien life here. Enrico Fermi wasn't the first person to actually tackle this question, but the answers that he provided or the insights that he came up with uh, kind of stick with us even to today, even though they, they were from so long ago. So first, I'm going to start with the math. Ah, oh, the math. Everyone loves the math. Uh, why? What, what were they discussing that morning into that afternoon that kind of got them so excited? And the main thrust of it is there are, there are billions and billions of stars in the Milky Way. And if we had to give a rough, rough estimate, it would be between something between 500 billion and 700 billion. Now, of those stars, 20 billion or so are very are sun-like, or around us, like are about the the, uh, uh, the the glow and power of our own sun. And of those, about four billion have planets that are within of what's called the Goldilocks zone, or the zone that's perfect for life to begin, like a, a halo zone of where that could begin. Now, if we took only 0.1% of those planets, that means there's a million, a million planets right now out there where life could be, life could exist the way that it's existing here on our, our, Earth, our planet. And that's just present day. So let's go even further back. The universe itself is about 13 and a half billion years old. The Milky Way is about 300 million years old. But for the first two billion years old, two billion years, the uh, Milky Way is very exploding. <laughs> is the best way I would describe it. There was a lot of explosions happening everywhere. It, was very, it wasn't a very easy place for life to exist. So if we took that into account, you still have about seven billion years until the Earth begins and four and a half billion years until we are here. So with that timing and with all these stars and planets out there, where is everybody? <laughs> so that's where Enrique Fermi, that's where the, uh, the concept of the math that he was getting into, that's where it came from. And if you had that many, let's say, wow, one million planets out there, and you actually were able to uh, create a spaceship that could habitate a, a large group of people and travel the universe, it would take around two million years to travel the entire Milky Way, which seems like a very long time. But again, we're talking about seven billion years until the Earth was created, four and a half billion years while the Earth was actually created, which means that these aliens could be flying around, zip around, we should be seeing them, and yet we're not. So there's big questions about that, and Fermi dug into these. And the way that he j jumped into this, like, this concept was he looked at filters, uh, places where societies or cultures would have uh, col uh, collapsed, would have been destroyed. Uh, in the past, we've seen some of these, and the major one being life itself. Scientists still to this day actually don't know how life is created. Uh, we know evolution and we know uh, how we've gotten to certain steps, but we don't know how the spark that kind of sets life in motion. Uh, the other ones in the past, you're, you're probably familiar with anyway. Um, uh, dinosaurs, for example, were eliminated by asteroids. Uh, we, we almost we lost about half of the European population to the Black Death disease. Is, 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 is a really easy way for us to be wiped off this planet. I don't know if people are familiar with the Toba super volcano, but about 70,000 years ago, there was an eruption so large that it created a thousand year winter uh, that humanity somehow survived. Uh, super volcanoes are, are a pretty big deal. I don't know if people are familiar, but the Yosemite uh, National Park uh, is, is set to explode any day now. <laughs> And they're, they're actually they're they're kind of concerned and trying to figure out a way because every four hundred thousand years it should be uh, it should erupt and that time is kind of near. Uh, these are all things that could have wiped us out in the past, and even present day there are certain certain uh, events that could wipe out humanity. Climate change uh, being an easy one, but nuclear weapons uh, being one that's been around for for very for a very long time, and also if you think about how. The Earth is four and a half billion years old. If within the last hundred years we've been able to communicate outside to other alien species and develop weapons that could just eliminate the planet completely, with so within that hundred year span, you're you're having the ability to speak out to the rest of the universe and then also die quickly. And that might be help happening else, elsewhere. As soon as these these civilizations are created, they might be wiped out before they even begin. Which leads me to the future kind of filters. Uh, that Fermi got into, uh, things that we couldn't foresee coming anyway. Uh, there might be a 
uh, I saw an article where they were discussing this, a, some type of machine that like, we create in the future and we think to ourselves, ah, this machine, this machine will save all of our lives, it will make everything better, and as soon as we hit the switch, everything is destroyed. <laughs> and we're, we don't even know that it exists yet. The other one that they spoke about was aliens might be out there. They might be watching us uh, and waiting until uh, we reach a certain point. And as, as soon as we get to that point, they will come and make sure that we don't go any further as, as not to disrupt the universe, which is a kind of a scary thought. But the other biggest one, if we move beyond Fermi, because uh, he wasn't the first scientist, he was just kind of one of the more famous ones to talk about it. We, if we move beyond just the fact that do we, we, if we need a sunlight planet and distance, but other things, there are other factors that make us unique at Azure. My favorite one is our big brother, Jupiter. Uh, so the space is very scary. There are a lot of things flying back and forth. And having a giant planet like Jupiter is almost like a magnet for asteroids. And it's, it's very rare to have a, like, uh, a universe like that. So if you start to add those factors and beyond just kind of space, time, and those factors go to 10, 50, and even to, to modern day about 100 or so, the number of planets not just goes down, like, or number of planets possible of containing life, not just goes down to zero, but actually goes below zero. We shouldn't be here, technically by science, but somehow we are. Thank you, Master Speaker.